and then I'm going to introduce Yaakov. So Yaakov is a full stack developer and software architect with over 20 years of professional experience as both a developer and a team lead. He is a part-time faculty member at the master's program of John Hopkins University Whiting, Whiting School of Engineering, where he has taught web development for the past 18 years. For the past six years, Yaakov's web development courses on Coursera.org have surpassed 800K students. He is also an open source developer. His latest project is MongoUnit.org, which is a data-driven integration testing framework for Java Spring boot-based applications that use MongoDB for persistence. The framework enables a developer to test the data access logic with relative ease. So without further ado, Yaakov, you want to take over and share your screen, please. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, everybody can see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. All right, so uh, hello from the uh, freezing Baltimore. I'm not jealous of San Diego at all. I am actually, it's uh, nice and warm over there. I was once vacationed there in the middle of winter. It was like I traveled to summer again, it was great. <laughs> um, so kind of jealous of your weather, but uh, here we go. So so today's talk, I'm gonna speak about replacing NG deep for good. So, um, and if you don't know what that is, I'll, I'll show you what that is in a second. Now I did put some slides a little bit about me, but truth is uh, I think Julie already just about covered everything. So I'm just gonna skip all that uh, and go straight to, uh, to the talk. Okay, so um, when we speak about Angular, especially you know the latest Angular, uh, we're speaking about component-based architecture. And what is really a component? A component is, it's a black box. So what does a black box mean? It means that I don't know how it's implemented as a client of that black box, right? As a client of that component, I don't know how it's, it's implemented and I really shouldn't have to know. Now, part of the component, since you know, regular, let's say a REST API is something, again, a black box to you as a client, um, but it's really just functionality that you're obfuscating. But part of a UI component is also view encapsulation. So something that is kind of a presentation inside of the component is also uh, stuck deep inside of that component. And again, you have the same type of principle applies it's a black box idea. I don't know how you implemented your component. I don't know what you use divs, you use paragraph. I don't know what's going on in there. And I really shouldn't have to know. And that applies to styles of the component as well. And one of the things I uh, actually really like about Angular is that uh, it has a very uh, an idea that is super native to it, which is called view encapsulation. And just to, for people who are not necessarily familiar with what that is, what is view encapsulation in Angular? Well, it's the ability in general without uh, too much uh, uh, tech talk here. It's really the ability for me to be able to code my component without being without worrying that I name the style the same that, as somebody else names the style in their own component. And then we're gonna start fighting, you know, whose style actually is gonna win. I don't have to worry about that in Angular. I could uh, code my component uh, put whatever styles and name them however I want. I want to structure the component however I want. And the external or other components are not going to be affected by it. So for example, so here we have two components. We have component A, component B. They're pretty identical components, except that, uh, well, we'll see there. First of all, the view encapsulation, something that we could turn on and off in, in Angular. And in this case, we'll do emulate it. So it's going to emulate what's called a shadow DOM which means it's going to basically encapsulate all of the styles and all of the HTML is gonna encapsulate in the, uh, in the component itself, or which is what's called the shadow DOM. And Angular can emulate that even if your browser is not supporting it. And I think pretty much all the browsers at this point support it, but either way, uh, it has this emulated mode. So the only difference between the two components is that I have this uh, div that I styled with the class hello, and in the component A, it's color blue, and a component B, it's color green. So now if I use that same component or those components side by side in the same HTML template, right? Component A and component B, I will get 
the same component because kind of the same code, but one will be blue and another one will be green. So that's the basic idea of uh, component encapsulation and style encapsulation that's going on here, which is, again, a pretty cool idea just, just on its own. We have a complete separation of things and we have this very uh, central to computer science type of an idea of kind of partitioning things and they're not stepping on each other uh, in any way, shape or form. Okay, well, it's all well and good, but what if I need to customize my component styles? Um, uh, I wanna have my component is a reusable piece of functionality, but again, it's not just functionality, it's also the reusable UI piece and a reusable style. So if I wanted to somehow customize it to a particular uh, application of that component, how, how do I do that? Well, if you look at Angular Docs, here's what it's gonna tell you. So you should consider the styles of a component to be private implementation details for that component. When consuming a common component, meaning you're using that component, you should not override the component styles anymore that you should access the private members of a TypeScript class, right? Again, that black box idea. So the question I guess is this, what does that mean? Does, does that mean, is the Angular documentation telling you that once you have a component, you can never change its styles in any way, shape or form. You have to actually go to the source code to change it, ask the original author to do it. So I don't think so. I think they actually, they wrote uh, this doc very carefully. I think they were careful with their words. And I think what it means is that you can't access anything just like you would access private member variables of a TypeScript class. But if you have other, um, if you have other structures that you can use to access or to change, um, uh, to change the kind of the inner uh, part of a component, that's totally fine as long as they follow that same paradigm. In other words, let's let's give an example for this private member variables. Right, you can't really change them directly, but you can have a setter that changes a private member variable indirectly. Right, so there's mechanisms to be able to kind of change what's going on inside. What it's saying is you just can't, you really shouldn't be able to kind of stick your hand inside of that component and, you know, muddle around there and then uh, do something with it. That is not a good idea. So, so how do we do that? So in Angular, one solution that Angular um, has and it's a pretty standard solution is use this special ng-deep, um, uh, uh, I guess, prefix for or a classifier or um, I forgot what the word is, but um, pseudo class. Here we go. It's right on my slide. So you could uh, apply this ng-deep pseudo class to any CSS rule, and it completely disables view encapsulation for that rule. So any style with ng-deep apply, you know, applied to it becomes all of a sudden a global style. So basically what you're saying is I might want to, well, not I might want to, I, I want to be able to style something differently the way the author of the original component styled, and I just wanna go ahead and like kind of crack open this uh, um, component and reach right in there, grab this particular uh, property or style and just like open it up to the entire world. And that, that way it's no longer encapsulated. And that way I can, actually, um, I can actually mess with it however I want on the outside as the client. So let's see what, what an example looks like. So we have a component, hello one, hello version one component. And uh, if you see view encapsulation again is emulated. So we're still going to encapsulate stuff. And again, it's a hello div, uh, hello with a class div or div with a class hello and the uh, color blue, right? So that's basically the style that I set to it. So if I wanted to use this style component, I could use it in let's say app component.html and then you could see I'm using it here twice. Once I'm using it in its default kind of version and the second way I'm using it with just giving it class green version one. So what does this class green version one do? Well, if I open up my component, uh, that app uh, component that CSS, you'll see what I'm doing here is I'm using this ng-deep um, on, the, on the green version one, and I'm kind of reaching in to whatever it is that green version one class is sitting on, which is our hello version one component. And I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna reach in there and it's going to be a div and it's going to have a hello class. And I'm gonna override that to be green. So um, just so you remember, hello, the component.ts had this template where they had a div and has a class hello and that there's a hello with a name, right? So basically I reached in there through 
the outside, the client of my component, I reached in into my com hello component and I changed the color from blue to green. So now, um, as I'm uh, outputting those components on the screen, you can see one is the default one, which is hello Angular in blue, and the other one is in green, okay? So that's basically the entire idea be behind the ng-deep. It, uh, it makes this whole thing global. Now notice here that I'm actually prefixing, not just starting with ng-deep div.hello, div I'm actually prefixing it with host and that gr uh, green uh, version uh, version one, dash V1. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because, remember, I just said, it's kind of cracking open that nutshell of that component, and it makes this whole uh, um, CSS global. And I don't want that every time there is anywhere div.hello in the entire application, that it should turn into color green. I don't want that. I just want to kind of uh, uh, localize that to just this instance because I'm just going to adjust something uh, for this particular uh, instance of, of usage of this component. Okay, so the entire solution basically boils down to this line. This is what you just saw in the previous slide. And the question is, why is that bad? Like, what, what, what is it? What is that's just a big deal? In fact, if you look at Angular documentation, um, it's been there now for years that are saying that ng-deep is deprecated and one day they'll come up with something that's gonna be much, much more beautiful than that. But right now it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's something that everybody uses, but uh, it's not something that is looked up to, let's, let's just say, as a solution. So why is that bad? Well, for one, it only works with emulative, uh, emulated mode. A real shadow DOM will not work with this at all. It basically, it's a basically an Angular framework hack in order to get this thing to work. That's the bottom line is because Shadow DOM is a standard. And um, once you're in emulated version, in the emulated world, Angular can take care of this for you. But once you're in a real Shadow DOM world, Angular can't do that because that's just not the standard. It also, we also must remember to at least include this host. Otherwise the style will just bleed all over the entire app. So that, that's not a good thing either. It's just because you forget something so simple and all of a sudden, you know, your components are all green everywhere all over the place. That's not something we want. And also, if you've ever used ng-deep, you will know this uh, painfully and personally is that you almost always have to fight with the complex CSS specificity. So if you have, you know, in, in here we have a super easy component as a div and a hello class, but if you imagine like a whole uh, a bunch of HTML and a whole bunch of layout and the, the DOM within that particular component could get really complex, and they also the CSS that goes with, could, with it could get really complex. So trying to override that is always uh, kind of a fight to, you know, of uh, CSS specificity, which is always uh, fun to deal with. But actually the biggest problem with all of that, with uh, this actual solution is this, is that it breaks the entire API, whole API paradigm. You must know the specific implementation of the component, right? So here we had ng-deep and we reached into the component and we have to know that the component is implemented with div and that we have to know that the component has a hello class applied to that div. If we didn't know that, and remember we started with the fact that you shouldn't have to know that. That's the whole point of a component. It's its its, its own uh, kind of a not black box. But in this case, you actually do have to know uh, uh, the internals of it. So that's a bad thing. So what's the alternative? The one alternative, at least something that uh, we've been using more and more in, the latest project I've, I've been on is we use CSS variables. And, and why do we even want to use CSS variables? Well, number one is this is what's designed to pierce the shadow DOM. It's actually a standard. It's not, it's not a hack. It's a standard-based uh, approach. And it's declarative and it's API-like. You're right back to it's not obviously a getter or a setter, but in the CSS world, it's a, it's a declarative mechanism to be able to reach into and pierce the shadow DOM and be able to affect things that you don't even see yourself implementation of uh, in the CSS world. And it cascades just like CSS should. So if you declare a particular variable and define it at a particular level in the DOM, it's not gonna bleed all over your, uh, um, your DOM. It's just gonna do just like CSS does. It's gonna apply to that element and anything below it and will not uh, bleed anywhere else. And it does not depend on select the specificity. So no more fighting with very complex internals of, of a particular component. 
Okay, so let's now re-implement that same component, <laughs> that hello component, and we'll have this component version two. And if you notice this time, the encapsulation that I'm putting on is I'm actually telling Angulars, go ahead and use a real shadow DOM because I don't care that it's, it has to be emulated. I just want a full blown shadow DOM. And if you look here, so it's the same class div with class hello. And um, so first of all, right, the shadow DOM. And also when I'm specifying the color, instead of directly specifying the color, I'm specifying the color using this uh, CSS variable called hello, uh, hello color. And since I want some default, I can actually specify it right then in place so that it, it's not declared at all anywhere. <clears throat> so I'm not forcing anybody, any clients of this component to actually define hello world because I'm saying that if it's not defined, it's fine. I'm just gonna give you the default color, which is blue. Okay, so now um, the last step is, is for me to actually publish to all my, to my clients, the clients of this component, you know, somewhere uh, in the documentation to publish that, hey, there's such a thing as hello color and you should know that you could change it if you want to just specify. It. Okay, so now we're going back to our app.component.html. And again, we're using the same component, except version two, we're using it twice. The first time we're using it without specifying anything on it. So it's gonna be the default blue color. And the second time we're gonna specify that green dash V2 class. So what is that green dash V2 class going to do? All it's going to do is it's going to define the hello color uh, as a CSS variable, as a CSS property, right? There is nothing else to do. Now we've pierced the actual shadow DOM using a standards based approach. And now the same component will show up with color uh, green. So now it says hello angular in green. So that's really basically the entire approach. So now just in summary, so remember we talked about the component being a black box. So you don't know, you don't care what it, in its inner code is supposed to look like. And component styles are best treated like private members, just like any private member variable of a TypeScript class. So MGD, while it's really widely used, it can be used, but it's got a lot of shortcomings. Uh, not the least of them is that it breaks the entire black box paradigm and it needs to be constrained and uh, you know, it bleed, can, you know, could bleed all over the place in your, uh, in your CSS and your other parts of uh, your web application. So it's got, it's got quite a bit of number of negatives. On the other hand, CSS variables, they provide a very clean declarative and most importantly standards-based way to customize your components um, and make things actually much, much simpler for developers as well. Because again, you don't have to deal with CSS specificity. You don't have to know how a component is implemented as long as you know, whoever is publishing this component tells you there's certain things you can declare at whatever level in your DOM you want to declare them, they will just magically uh, pierce through the shadow DOM and uh, uh, customize your, uh, your component for you. Okay, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for listening. These are my uh, handles if you ever wanna uh, look me up and I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You know, I have to admit that I was just looking at code today that has a whole bunch of ng deets in it. And every time I look at it, I'm like, I really need to get rid of those. I really should get rid of those. And now you have just, <laughs> you've just made me, I'm now motivated to get rid of all those ng deeps in my in the code that yeah, I once you put the CSS variables in it, actually the code becomes extremely clean. It becomes very, very intuitive as well. Yep, yep. I'm gonna do that right now. <laughs> well, when I work tomorrow, I will do that. Do we have any questions for Yakov? I think my only question is that your solution, uh, Yakov, it, it looks really straightforward and elegant. So why, why like the community doesn't take this as like the go-to approach instead of MGT? So, or have you used, have you seen me use it before in, in, around or? So, right, so two answers. So I have seen it being used before. Um, I, so I think there's a several answers or probably several layers of answers of why that is. One is that, um, it's not mentioned anywhere. It's so, you know, it, it's almost like I'm presenting a hack and ng deep is the solution. Like it's actually the other way around. Um, so it's number one. Number two is 
I think where it comes out the most and the question that I get the most about it uh, is uh, the material design components. And material design components, uh, I actually reached out to one of the uh, uh, core committers uh, on that library and I asked him that as to why, why aren't they using CSS variables? And the answer that I got was for them to use CSS variables for everything would be not feasible because it's just too many things. I, I don't really, I, I think I need to sit on that answer for a while and think about it because I don't know if I understand it 100% because you know, it's material design components have a, a very custom way of styling if you want to create a theme. So that's what they go through that process or you have, you have to go to that process, you have to create a theme. The problem is in practice that I, I, I guess I have yet to see in practice where you create a theme and it's just beautiful all over. Like you never have to customize it. It just doesn't work out that way. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if that's just happens to be that all the things I've seen that never worked out that way, but it doesn't. So therefore that's where NG Deep comes out like all the time. So, um, you know, if they ever change their mind about it or there's, you know, maybe something will change, but I think that's the, that's the biggest reason, right? Because that's probably the number one most used library is the, is the Angular material library. Yep. And, uh, you know, and if they're not going to do it, you know, I, I don't know where people are just going to get the idea of doing it. But certainly, even if they're not going to do it, you yourself writing your own components in your own, you know, project, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. And there's absolutely zero reason to have to go to NGD and, and deal with all this craziness. Uh, if you know that there's a couple of things that you're going to need to... Uh, strategically you know change in the future i mean i personally think that they should try to do that at least on certain you know on certain level i mean i i don't know those guys are super super smart so i'm assuming there's a really good reason for for not doing it but um i'll have to think about it as to why really not thank you cool yeah i think a lot of it's just old i know ours is a lot of old code and people who wrote it a long time ago and it's just carried over, but time to get rid of it. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> okay, I think we're gonna move along at a quick pace and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna introduce Dennison now because it turns out he's far away as well. And so I am, um, I would like to introduce Dennison. Dennison Luz is a multidisciplinary digital artist and software engineer with over 10 years of experience in web development. His, web, his work encompasses art, software development, and digital media creation using different medias, including software engineering, computer graphics, audio video production, and photography. At the moment, Dennison works as a web developer consultant at Bitovi. So take it away, Dennison. Hey, hi everybody. I think that's the easiest way to just tell people that I do a lot of different things. Yes, it is. <laughs> cool, I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay. Can you guys see it? Yes, we can. Perfect. So hi, my name is Dennison Luz. I'm a consultant, a software engineer working for Bitovi. I was invited by uh, AJ Mark to do this presentation today. Really happy you guys invited me. And today we're going to talk about end-to-end -end testing uh, with Angular. And I'm going to try to give a little bit of what is the state of end-to-end -end testing with Angular these days. So before we go into the end-to-end -end testing and uh, with Angular, let's talk about the end-to-end -end testing. What, what is that? So I think the best way to describe is, is that you we have the unit test, like like Yakov was uh, presenting components. So we have this little piece of code, there are components, and they sometimes they work really well together. And we use the unit test to test those piece of code, those components, if they perform well. But we don't know sometimes if those same components, when they put together, like in the right-hand side, you see here this transformer, and you put in all the pieces together, you don't know exactly if they're going to work exactly how uh, we expect them to work. So the same way we test those units, you know, separately, uh, one by one, we should also test them integrated as a, a whole piece all together. Uh, yeah, so let me go. A good analogy as well is like, let's just think about a car, right? If 
you have a car or you are building a car, you have many pieces in that car. You have the wheels, you have the tires, uh, the motor, everything is there. And probably the, the, the fabric, you know, the manufacturer is manufacturing each little piece to perfection and everything is worked well by itself. But we also need to make sure that once you put all those pieces together in an actual car, everything is also going to keep working together at the shoes. So um, the tires, the wheels, everything's going to work together. So with this analogy, it's the same thing about talking about uh, web, web developer or any kind of software development. Uh, you have the components, functions, methods that they are working in isolated, but we need to make sure that once you put them together, they're going to you know, do exactly what they are supposed to do. So that's when it comes to end-to-end testing. And here, just have a little image, try to describe just what I, what I told you. Like you have a car, you look outside the car, they look well, everything's together, but when you try to not kick the car, but when you try to use the car, everything falls apart because sometimes things are working well separately, but not you know, when you put things together. And why should we care? Why should we care about unit you know, tests or engineering tests and, and just tests in general? Because we are still humans. I know we are like, you know, working like robots sometimes and we like to code and we have this relationship with the machine, but AI and things like that, but we're gonna make mistakes, right? That's that's our our life as developers. You're always gonna make mistakes. And the a good way to uh, avoid these mistakes, or at least to avoid them to repeat, is to test them, to test our uh, components and also test the components together as a whole. And also there are some benefits of uh, using uh, and doing end-to-end -end testing. Some of the benefits are detect bugs, uh, ensure the correctness of the application. So you make sure that you know the pieces together, they're gonna work well together. You can expand test coverage. Uh, now talking about specifically about end-to-end -end testing, you, once you do the unit test, when you do the integration and you start to run end-to-end tests, you're gonna make sure that the application as a whole, uh, from uh, the beginning of the journey of the user until the, the end of the test that he's trying to complete, everything's gonna work well. Reduce costs, because once you detect the bug, it's faster, you can fix it faster, and also reduce the time to market. Because once you find, the quicker you find the bug, the quicker you're gonna fix it, and the, the quicker you're gonna uh, ship, deliver. So the benefits are potentially huge. So what are the tools? But before I talk about the tools, I, I also like to make an analogy about uh, internet tests that is the following that I, I, I just want to have an idea, like if you guys in the chat can just tell me if you guys have used internet tests before, just say I have or I never had, because it's similar from my experience, like the, uh, the doctor recommendation that you have uh, fruits or vegetables five times a day. We know that's good. We know we should be eating more fruits and vegetables, but we don't. Like in general, most of the people, they don't, but they know they're good for you. So unit tests, intern tests is pretty much like this. In most of the companies, they know they should be doing intern tests. They know they should be doing unit tests, but because they need to deliver as fast as possible, most of the time they are not doing intern tests. So I'm just going to skip to the next one. So now let's go. Now that we understand that you know, they are the importance of the unit test and intern test, and when it comes to Angular, what tools we have out there uh, so we can use to do intern tests. So uh, until January 2021, there was a tool uh, that came with Angular. The, this tool kind of was born with a Angular JS and it's called Protector. But I think uh, last year or 2014, yeah, uh, Angular deprecate. <laughs> I don't know exactly how to say that word, but they they, they don't ship the Protector anymore, and they don't recommend you to uh, use Protector anymore for many reasons. But most of the reasons that there are many other options out, out there. They are faster and they support multiple browsers these days. So they kind of gave up the idea of the provide protractor as the end-to-end uh, tool for using the Angular. And now we have many other uh, frameworks. Some of these frameworks before, uh, they were based in Selenium. 
uh, basically Selenio is a framework, automation task framework. They use a web driver uh, to interact with the browser. Web driver, I don't want to get too technical, but basically web driver is a HTTP protocol that makes you interact with the browser remotely. So you can, uh, you can interact with the browser and pretend that you are user, that the user. So you can click in buttons, you can type in, you know, in input box, you can uh, drag something, you can scroll as you were the user. And for that, you would need uh, the Selenium web driver to do that. But now these days we have more modern uh, frameworks. And today we're gonna to talk about the top two, at least my personal preference. Now we also the, the market, I'm gonna show you some graphs and you're gonna see that the, a lot of people they are already using most of these uh, these two frameworks. One of them is Playwright and the other one is Cypress. So that's the state of the internet testing these days. So you can see here we have 64% of people that are out there using Cypress. Protractor, by the time they did this uh, research, I think it was 2021, uh, was less than 20%. And so uh, Cypress has been dominate uh, the, the end-to-end -end test as, as uh, option. And you can see here on uh, this uh, orange dot, you have Puppeteer. There, there was another option that was also using Selenium, uh, a web driver to interact with the, with the browser. But this uh, Puppeteer was, ma was managed by Google and the team was you know, part of Google. They came out uh, they left uh, Google and they start to work in another framework called Playwright. And they start to work for Microsoft as well. So this group of people, they used to work for Google with Puppeteer. Uh, they left Google and they went to Microsoft and they create Playwright. And Playwright these days is, you know, uh, it's getting a lot of uh, momentum and people are using a lot as well. So I would say that the top two these days is Cypress and Playwright they're using. So let's just talk a little bit about the difference between um, Playwright and uh, Cypress. So you guys can see, let me make it a little bit bigger. Uh, doesn't work, so it's not bigger. But basically I'll just put side by side the difference between Playwright and Cypress. So uh, Playwrights compared to Cypress is, is, is newer. So I think it's about to, uh, Cypress two years older than, than Playwright at least. But uh, Playwright has provided other features that Cypress two behind. So for example, language supports, Playwright supports, you can use JavaScript to write Java, Python, and C Sharp. Cypress is, supports JavaScript, and I think now it also supports TypeScript. Uh, test runner frameworks, you can use Jazz, Jasmine, Cypress. At the time, uh, this uh, uh, research was only merchant. And architecture has less browser. And then with Cypress, yeah, that's case directly. Uh, if you, you can also, just to make sure that this has less browsers that you can run and interact with browsers to run the test, but you don't, don't need to launch the browser. So for example, if you have a CI environment, so continuous integration, that's perfect because you don't want to launch the browser in the server. You can just run the test and then run the everything without launching the browser. You can do this in Cypress, but you know you need to install a plugin for it. So Cypress is really powerful, but doesn't have these features that comes out of the box like Playwright. So for this one, you will need to install some kind of plugin for it. Browser support, uh, now they are the same. This is new, Cypress uh, some time ago was only Chrome, but now they are providing support for most of the browsers. iframe support, so there are other things here that are interesting, let me just see. Uh, see the integration, yes, everything. So both of them, they are doing pretty much the same thing. I'm just going to show here what looks like Playwright code. So you can see here that's a, a test case within uh, with Playwright. And you can see that Spring my look, looks like uh, normal JavaScript, right? We have functions here, and you pass a, a string as a, a parameter, and then another as, as a function as well here. And most of these functions are asynchronous functions because they need to wait for response. 
for the browser. And in Playwright, that response, uh, it's, it's just like a normal uh, asynchronous call. So you wait, you request and just wait for that response. Yeah. It's like normal. With Cypress, it's also similar to JavaScript. Uh, it is JavaScript in the end of the day, but you can see that the style that it does is more kind of a chain, like a jQuery style, like you have cy.visit, cy.login. So you can concatenate uh, you know, the commands that you want to interact to do the assertions and or to interact with the, with the page. So here, page part get quantity equals to zero, should have that one. So that looks much more like a jQuery style than a JavaScript one. Cool. So I'm gonna try to do a quick demo and this is just a video I'm gonna play and I'm gonna stop time to time. This is from the original documentation of Cypress and I hope that works, but that's the to do uh, MVC application and just uh, type in to see the application working, we can select things and then here. I'm gonna pause sometimes just to give it some ideas of what's going on. Okay, so let me just go back here quickly. So, so here is creating a test case and for this to do MVC. And you have a hook here, just like uh, Angular has those lifecycle hooks, like on init and um, on destroy. You also can create some hooks in uh, Cypress or in the test case. So it says like before every uh, test, you should go cy.visit the URL that you want to test. And then here you're gonna start to create some association, some the test. You know? And then you see like it display to do apps. So function, so cy.get h1 should contain to do so pretty much it's going to open the browser, go to the this URL. We're going to try to interact with the browser, get the element H1 and do a kind of a assertion that, you know, that H1 uh, element should contain the word to do. And here you can see uh, the uh, interface that Cypress kind of opens another browser uh, that comes with, with Cypress. And then it's gonna run your application inside of this browser and they're gonna run the test for you. And then in the left-hand side, you have a kind of inspector that's gonna test each one of your tests. So you can check here what's, what's doing. And this is really powerful because uh, imagine now it's easy because you only see one test, but imagine you have you know, hundreds of tests. Uh, you can combine, separate and organize. But then here you can, one by one, you can go and you can see exactly what are the steps of they are doing uh, for the test. And also you can inspect and see, you know, in part, in what, what exactly which point the test was failing or not. Okay, so here's another station. So we say you can add a new to do. So again, it's kind of jQuery style. So cy.get new to do, that's an element. There's an element with ID new to do. And then in that element, that's the input box. You ask him, uh, Cypress to type as a, the user, because that's the whole idea. You're gonna impersonate the user. You're gonna interact at the page, with the page, just like a user would. So you'd get the input and then you type, walk the dog and then enter. And then once you type enter into the to-do, the, uh, the list, you know, uh, the to-do list should add this walk the dog as an item. There you go. And here's just saying that, showing that, you know, you, you visit the, the, the place, the URL, and then you get the new to-do, you type enter, and then you, you do the assertion and expect the item to be there. So I think now I'm just gonna show another example. So 
I'm going to stop here because uh, I think the most important thing that I want to share with you guys is that how easy it is to interact with the page. And the one really good thing about Cypress is that how easy it is to understand as well. Like if you if your team uh, is thinking about using kind of end-to-end tests, Cypress has a great documentation and it's really uh, easy to learn. Uh, the language, it's really easy to learn. The syntax is really to, to follow. And you can see step-by-step -step what it's doing here as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna try failing. So it's going. There we go. So here it's just showing exactly the same task, but now it's just create a, a failed test. And then you can see you can step through it. You can just like go, uh, it's like a time machine. You can go back to you know move forwards or backwards, and then you can see exactly where the, 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 the test is failing. And again, uh, the point is that for entrance tests, I'm not really interested about the functions that it's doing. Let's just say there's a function that's uh, getting the, the element and adding into the, the list. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the whole integration, how the, the page works as a whole, as a, a whole piece. Let's see if there's anything interesting here. No, that's it. Okay, let's go now. Oh, yeah. But this one, I'm going to be brave and I'm going to try to, uh, to run this one and show you guys something else. I showed the, the Cypress one. So now I'm going to try to show you uh, using Playwright. So I'm just running uh, this command in Playwright and it's called uh, Code Generation Feature. And I pointed to these to do as well. But the cool thing is that Playwright is running in the background, but anything that I do here, you can see there's a, this inspector here. There's part of a Playwright, sorry, there's a lot going on here. Stop. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, the, the page that I want to test is this one, the to-dos. And on the right-hand side here, you can see there's a Playwright inspector. And it kind of gives me already the uh, the basic of this uh, test case. So I'm importing here, you know, test and expect. And here's there's a kind of a function, a sync function as well, to go to that particular page that I'm testing. So now you're going to notice, and that's something really cool about this uh, feature in, in Playwright, that anything I do in this page that I'm interacting is going to create the code straight away here. So I just type here something like a any song loose. So everything that I did, like no, I press caps lock and then I feel Dennis song loose. And if I keep going, now I'm gonna do a enter. So I could create the whole test case just interacting the page. So it's quite powerful as well. So if I do um, another task. And then I click on that one, and there we go. And then you can, I click another one, and I have a test here. So once I have all of these done, completed, I could probably copy this whole test and save. And of course, I need to make some adjustments about selectors, about you know, uh, if I, how I'm going to select those elements. I'm going to select by a data attribute, by classes, by IDs, but uh, but it. it it, it kind of speed up a lot the process of creating tests using playwrights. So you can just you know, clear complete. So everything is this. It's happening in the background. Uh, let me just stop here and go back to. Oops. Well, and that's pretty much this. I think it was pretty quick, but if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to do more demonstration if you want. I wasn't really sure about the time, so that's why. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know about Playwright. We use Cypress, and so it was yeah. neat to see that in use. <laughs> <laughs>
So Cyprus, that was my first uh, choice to use. I liked Cyprus a lot. And because of a client that was working with us, the client was re uh, really keen to use Playwright. So I had uh, I have a window of two weeks to learn Playwright. And, and at first I thought that I would say, oh, I'm so used to Cyprus, I don't want to use Playwright, but I just fell in love with Playwright as well. It's really powerful, it's really easy to learn, and uh, the community is growing really fast. So there are a lot of really cool features. So yeah. I would re definitely recommend, as, as, as the doctor says, if you're not having your five a day, also have some uh, you know end-to-end -end testing and, and some uh, experience with Playwright in Cyprus that's really worthwhile. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Want to see any more? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm definitely going to have our team check out Playwright because it is worth it. I would yeah. recommend. Yeah, I know for me personally, I'm actually writing an Electron app right now. And I noticed in your comparison that Cypress uh, supports Electron, but yeah. Playwright doesn't yet. I think Playwright oh, supports now. No, it supports as well. Supports for Electron. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK. I'll have to check it out. I think Electron comes with Cypress out of the box, right? When it's all yes. Cypress. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK, I'll check it out, though. Do we have any more questions? How many of you oh, yeah. are actually going to start using doing E to E testing if you aren't right now? Mark just shared link. I shared the link with the Playwright Experiment Support Collection. Jerome, you're going to start doing end to end testing, right? <laughs> I'm picking on him because he said he. He does it as much as he likes vegetables. Oh, I test as much as I eat vegetables. Uh, <laughs> I would like to start doing it. Do you do any at your? No, unfortunately. Okay. And it makes me a little bonkers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It catches, for us, it, ca it catches a lot of mistakes. I mean, stuff is broken. When stuff breaks, it catches it. And so if there's something wrong with our system, you know, some piece of it is down somewhere along the way, the testing always catches it. And AJ's in there, our, our tester is AJ and he goes, hey, uh, is such and such broken? And it's like, oh, I guess oh, so. That, that's a good point. <laughs> I think there's a question up from the band. Is, no, they are all, all open source. Playwright and Cypher, they're all open source and free. Very good question, yeah, yeah. Hey, Dennis, and my internet dropped out so i'm gonna to have to go back and watch everything that you did <laughs> through the <laughs> recording thank you for recording it julie yeah um but just a quick question for you because i primarily i do full stack development and i'm doing c sharp in the back end and then angular in the front end yeah. um and playwright is this yeah. something that you you then are able to test you know, all the way through, or is this meant only for like the front end? Like if you're writing front end in C sharp with like Razor or something. I think you can also test the back end. And also I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some help for Mark because Mark is helping to create a plugin with Playwright Cucumber. And and in my mind before when we start to work with this plugin, I have this in my mind that you know we need the browser because I'm really front end developer. And then Mark realized, no, you actually sometimes you don't need the browser. If you're using Java or backend, you can create the end-to-end -end tests and using Playwright. And doesn't really mean that you need the browser. You need just you can run all the functions that you have, everything the components you have in, in Java, and you don't need the browser. So yeah, you can also use in the backend. Mm, okay. And and playwright support Java and C sharp. Awesome. I'm gonna check that out. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Nope. Okay, we're gonna move on to our final presenter. And AJ, if I mispronounce anything, I apologize in advance. So 
AJ is so good at development that sometimes I wonder if he is a Terminator sent back in time by Skynet to make the war a fair fight. And that was said by Jeremy Lag in 2018. Alexander Weeb, I hope that's right. Yep. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. AJ was born on January 12th, 1987, with a programmable calculator in one hand and a solved Rubik's Cube in the other. With roots in QBASIC, he's been coding ever since. Born and raised in the prairies, AJ is a local grad from U of R, Riverside. What's U of R? Right, uh, University of Regina. That's where I live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> While he loves his wife and daughter, JavaScript is his passion. AJ's experience involves N tier enterprise apps, rewriting a rowing machine's driver in TypeScript, and everything in between. So take it away, AJ. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, so I too, like Denison, work for Batovi. Um, so today I'd like to give a presentation around the container presenter pattern. Um, so just some quick housekeeping. I'll probably try and keep the introduction to a quick five minutes and then I'll go over the container presenter pattern. And then with any time left, I'm, I'm here for questions. So just to start a uh, quick introduction in case uh, I forgot to say anything, I always forget to update my bio. Uh, I have a son now, Kessler, um, but yeah, pretty much everything else already said. So don't have to spend too long on that. And then the, the bulk of the presentation going to cover like, why would you use container presenter? Uh, give some introductions into the architecture itself, do a bit of compare and contrast of what those two things are, um, and on some, some examples. And if there's any questions, feel free to ask. So with that, let's get started. Um, so today we've got to see some like very technical presentations. Um, container presenter isn't going to be that same level of uh, implementation in the code. This is uh, more of an architecture pattern. So you're not really using a library. You can apply this to Angular, you can apply it to React. Um, and the way you would enforce this is through like education, pull request, code reviews, all of that. Um, at a high level, this is dividing the user interface into two types of components. Um, one, the container, which handles the asynchronous pieces, any of the filtering or data queuing. In Angular, this is going to be lots of the RxJS pieces, whereas the presenter is focused on how that gets displayed to the user. Um, it's going to be stuff like uh, if you have a drop down component, all of that. And if this doesn't make sense now, don't worry about it. I have examples and I'll start diving into it in more and more detail as we go on. So at the top of uh, this diagram, we see the container component. So the, the first thing is one container can have one or more presenters. Um, in the past, this used to be called smart and dumb components. So if, if you've heard those terms before, um, it's the same concept, um, but it's, it, they, they change the language that they use for it. So containers being smart, presenters being dumb. Um, so yeah, a container can have one or more presenters and then you're using the inputs and outputs um, to communicate. So a container will use the at input directive to, pass into the presenter and presenters will be emitting events through the output. Um, if you, we'll get into some examples of this just to really clear it up. So again, as I mentioned, containers, this is where you have all the asynchronous parts. One of the big advantages of this is you get to use the Angular's pipe async 
Um, one of the main reasons you would be using pipe async is if you uh, use it, you don't have to worry about how you unsubscribe to your observables. So similar to end-to-end -end testing, eating your vegetables, you should always, always be unsubscribing from your observables. And pipe async just provides a really nice form factor so that you don't have to worry about that unsubscribe part. So then presenters, this is like the actual web page. Uh, this has the view logic, how, how the content appears, and it's using the at input and at output uh, for getting and setting all of the data. What, what that really is nice for is it provides a type of contract so that when you're debugging, you can see all the way that the data gets into the component and all the types of events that come out of the component. Um, I, the, the other two things, um, when you're dealing with the presenter, you, you don't want to force its own height or width. Uh, you don't want to say like it has to be 600 pixels or something. Um, one of the advantages of doing this is you can have um, a presenter being used in multiple locations in a website. So you don't want to say like it's 600 pixels because if it's in a modal, you'll want it to fit the modal or a slide out or any of those. The, the last thing I'll talk about with the presenter in this regard is um, it's not going to be injecting services um, where it's trying to get data. So in Angular, you have a service for, say, accessing people, uh, hitting the people API. That would be used within a container, whereas in a presenter, you wouldn't be trying to get that. Not to say that you can't use a service with a presenter. If you have something specific around like a display logic or stuff like that, that's free to put in a service. Um, one of the advantages of doing this in a project is when you get into the debugging or maintenance phase. Um, when a developer is trying to find a bug, if it's something that is um, around the data, like uh, in this table, we're supposed to see like 10 attributes or 10 entities, and we only see eight or something. Um, that immediately is showing that like you should look in your container for something like that. Whereas in the presenter, the types of bugs are like, oh, when I go to click the save button, it's cut off or it's too small. Um, and at a high level, uh, by using container presenter, you, you just cut your debug time in half because right off the hop, you're only looking at half of the components you normally would be. So let's get into an example. So with this, I just have a very um, couple attribute form for creating a ticket. So um, if if you're there's there's just two pages. Um, I have this example that when we get to the questions, I can go in more in depth with the code. But this is the container. So all it's doing is on the template side, it's just passing values into and getting events from the presenter component. That's that's all the template's doing. And then what we can do is we can check out the, the actual TypeScript part of it. So in the container, we're doing stuff like a combined latest on um, this is using a uh, selector from NGRX, but this could be any any service that is getting entities from the back end. It's combining it with the route params and same with the user and user by ID. And then for the events that it's listening on, the on save and on update, it's deciding where those events actually wind up going. So now on to the presenter. So the presenter on the left, we see like, this is where it's having the actual markup, where it's doing stuff like saying, oh, here's a description. Here's the, uh, it's using Angular reactive forms for the input. And then those buttons have the click events. 
And when we go to look at what those things are doing in the back end or in the TypeScript side, we can we can see a little bit more. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then I'm going to just do go through the actual app. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen. So this is the app. We have just a list of tickets, like install a monitor arm. So if I click this, I go to the form. I can change this, install a new desk, then update, and it takes it back, install a new desk. So the blue dotted lines indicate what the container is. And then the green solid lines indicate what the presenter is. So we see here the blue dotted lines and the green are pretty much the same because the container is just strictly wrapping that presenter. Okay, so now just going to go here. And if I share my code, just gonna close all of these. So this is how it would typically be structured. So you would start with your, your main entity. So have a module here and then you divide it. There's, there's a couple ways of doing it, but this is the, I think the most common way. You divide your components into the container and the component. So containers, like if we look at the ticket from the slide, Here. Okay. It's weird. So yeah, this is where we can see the actual edit being done, all the input of the uh, presenter, and then looking at the back end or the TypeScript for it it's you get a clearly defined contract um yeah <laughs> thanks mark <laughs> i've never seen that happen before either but i mean it wouldn't be a live demo without some excitement so the biggest thing with the presenter is that i have my clear set of inputs and my clear set of outputs which if you're using this, you can reliably go into the presenter to see where um, where that data is getting. And the other nice kind of side effect of this is that within the presenter, I'm never worrying about the asynchronous pieces, the the any any of that type of stuff. You're typically just worrying about like your form. Um, and then your save, you're looking at like if it's valid. And then you just emit. If this emission winds up going to NGRX or it's going to a service, that's all for the container to worry about. One of the reasons I like this pattern is specifically when I'm working as a consultant, um, sometimes people aren't familiar with the front end at all. So by being able to break it up. Um, if I take on the container and start looking at the um, how the data gets from where it needs to be, it can free that uh, developer that I'm pairing with so that they can focus on like, how does it look? How does the HTML get rendered? All of that. So yeah, with that, I'll just hop to the ticket. Components. So yeah, this is where you have the actual inputs. Want to try again? 
Still not working. Going on. And then just to end it off, this is where those things are getting piped async to that. So that is pretty much it. Here, let me just go back to here. Does anybody have any questions, concerns, queries? Are you is is that code available to look at and play with? Oh, it definitely is. Um, here. Oh, perfect. If you can plop that into the chat, that would be awesome. Hey. Awesome. Yeah. I'd like to mull on that a little bit and think about it. Do we have any questions for AJ? I have a question. Yeah. So as a consultant, when you're kind of, you know, you're going and you're seeing how people are building their Angular apps, what are some of the other ways that you see that they're building it that maybe you then are like, okay, well, let's try this kind of a pattern instead. And can you talk about, um, you know, what are some of the pros and cons of, you know, like give an example of something you see that, that you think this is a better way and what the pros okay. and cons are. Yeah, so when, I'll, I'll start with container presenter because that one's just kind of fresh in everybody's mind. I think container presenter pairs really nicely when you're dealing with state management. Um, so if you're, if you have a large site that's using NGRX or, one of the other ones. Um, I I really like NGRX. Um, it it pairs really nicely just because you you get into like a habit uh, of like this goes here, that goes there. Um, one of the other things I've seen from different clients is like there's like just ad hoc where people just start with with like a ng new and just kind of put components wherever they feel see fit. Um, that one, I'm, I think it's just like a, a nature of the beast, right? Like all things kind of trend towards entropy, um, just eventually get more and more disorganized. So the more organization we can put at the front pays off later. Um, but not all projects have that lifeline. Um, so I've been able to work on some projects that were, um, one was for a government website that had, they had like, it had to be up for four months. So their long-term maintenance was like, we don't have long-term maintenance because this thing is going to be shuttered in four months. Um, another project I was on that used Container Presenter um, I was on it for five years and they are still going. Um, and that was two years ago. Um, so it, it gives a bit of different size. Um, one of the other ones I've seen um, is the, uh, I'll see SCAM, uh, the single component angular module pattern. So that's where every single component um, gets its own module. And typically you, you have like one folder called components and it just dumps them all in. Um, that is a use case that I feel is good when you have like, if you're building an app and you know that it's going to be like less than 50 components, but as you, go up and up like uh, the project I was on for just under five years. We were at almost 700 some odd components when I left. Um, so with that one, you could just imagine like starting at a new project, you open one folder and you just see 700 components. It, it's pretty hard to, to reason about that. Um, so yeah. does that kind of give a couple uh, Options, couple answers. Yes, thank you. Awesome. I'm still 
mind boggled about the 700 <laughs> components. Are those, are those components in uh, containers in separate, uh, separated into different types of containers so that they're, they're uh, sort of self-contained and, and maybe there are uh, multiple containers with similar components? Yeah, so in that project, one of the things we did is we grouped, uh, we used Angular modules to describe major features of the application. So we would have uh, one Angular module. So like uh, for accounting, there was the chart of accounts module. Um, there was the capital assets module, on and on and on. Um, so if you knew a, like a, a bug or feature would come in and it would tell you which type of domain you're going to be working in. And if it was a new domain, usually there would be lots of meetings and we would make that module as part of the meeting just so no, nobody had to like kind of create a top level box or a top level construct on their own. Um, which which usually worked out pretty good. Uh, have you have you looked into writing schematics or using existing schematics to maintain container oh, presenters? Yeah, yeah. Oh man, um, it was probably like within six months of starting at this project. I was like man, we should be using schematics for this. It's going to be the best thing ever. And they were like, ah, you know, we're we're halfway through the project. There, we've probably built most of the components we're going to need. Um, we're like over the hump. And of course, that's, that's not what happened at all. Like uh, if we would have done it at that time, it would have saved so much time. Like especially because we're also using NGRX and one of the big criticisms of NGRX is that there's lots of boilerplate um in doing code reviews with people I would be like oh how'd you make all the NGRX entities like the the reducer effect selector they're like oh I just find one that somebody else made and I copy and paste it I'm like you you know that there's like a schematic that it, we were using Azure DevOps. So when you would create a task, it would give you the generate commands. Um, so you would just have to copy and paste the generate commands and it would like build all the files for you. Java is super happy, but nobody used it. Yeah, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to have so many of that started, but it's usually at that first, uh, inception of a project, there's so much pressure to start having output that they don't want to be like, we built something that helps us output faster. So, yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions for AJ? I would like to thank all of our wonderful speakers tonight. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. If I can find, oh, there it is. If I can find where to stop it. No, well, that's the wrong one. Jim and Dean DC, I lost it. Stop recording. There we go.